Welcome to worship this morning. It's good to know that we are all enjoying uh, the worship as we gather together in isolation at this time. As you will see, the look is a little bit different this morning. Uh, I've decided to choose a different location. I did film it in the manse garden, and for those that know the manse where I live, it's very close to a relatively busy road. Uh, and the traffic noise just meant that it was too distracting when I heard back the video. Uh, so uh, I've decided to come to the back of the, uh, the manse uh, and the chapel and use the bottom field here to record today. I hope the traffic noise doesn't distract people. I can still hear it in the distance, but hopefully it won't appear on the video today. So welcome to church today. Wherever you are, whoever you're with, however you're feeling, we come into the presence of God. And I want to read to you some words from Revelation chapter 5, verse 13. And we read there. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honour and glory and might forever and ever. Wonderful words from John who wrote this book of Revelation, the vision that he saw. And as we heard about the uh, whole creation singing God's praise in that verse from Revelation chapter 5, we're going to sing a great hymn of praise. Before the throne, of God above. We'll join together in singing in worship. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong love of thy plea, a great high priest whose name is love, who forever lives and pleads for me. My name is great. Let us pray. Father God, as a parent loves their child, so you love your children. We come before you in song, prayer, and in the reading and reflecting on your word in the Bible. We come with words and we come in silence to offer you our praise, but also to receive from you in this time that we share together. United in the presence of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit. We come and praise you for your creation, for the world we can share, and for the beauty of each of the seasons. We praise you, Lord. We come and praise you for the beauty of each other, for the differences between us and the differing gifts you give to each of us. May we never take them for granted, but always give you thanks and praise for them. We come and praise you for all you have given to us, for food, drink, and all that we enjoy day by day. 
May we never take these for granted, but always thanks, give thanks and praise for them. We come and praise you for Jesus, who changed, changes and will continue to change lives. From the 12 disciples Jesus called to follow him, to the millions and millions of followers around the world today, we give you thanks and praise. Amen. As we continue to journey through this great letter to the Colossian church, we're going to hear uh, a reading now. Reading today is taken from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 17, Rules for Holy Living. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above and not on earthly things, for you died when your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and to put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all the wisdom as you sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your heart to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. Thanks be to God for these words. We sing our next song, which is, What Kind of Love Is This?
We come to part one of our reflecting on God's word to us today. Let us pray as we come into God's presence. Almighty God, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks that it teaches and trains, comforts and challenges. Open our ears and our hearts to your word, that we may hear what it is you have to say to us today. May it change us and transform us and make us more like Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. There was a poet and physician who lived at the end of the 19th century, an American called Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., and he is quoted as saying, and I'm sure this word, these words may well be words you've heard before. And he said, some people are so heavenly minded that they are of no earthly use. You may have heard those words quoted before, but I think they contradict what Paul is saying in this letter to the Colossian Christians. For we heard in verse 1 and 2 of our reading, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. That in many ways contradicts that saying about being of no uh, earthly use because they're so heavenly minded. And if you remember the words in chapter 2 and verse 8 of what Paul wrote, he said this, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than than on Christ. Let us not forget that Paul is writing this letter to correct some strange thinking and belief system of Gnosticism in the Colossian church. And he's warning them against hollow and deceptive philosophy. And in many ways, they've done the opposite of what uh, that statement says. They've been so focused on earthly things that they've been of no, in some ways, of no heavenly use. 
They've taken their eyes off God, off Christ and what Christ taught, and focused on earthly things. In other words, Paul is reminding his listeners or readers that they must look to God and not to earthly things. They must keep their focus upon God so that they can truly follow where he is leading them. And some of the earthly things that they've got involved with are leading them astray. And Paul lists some of them helpfully in, in verse 5 of chapter 3. Paul says to his leaders, uh, listeners or readers of some of the earthly things that might be distracting them. Sexual immorality, he says. Impurity. Lust. Evil desires. And greed, which is idolatry. A list of things perhaps that Paul sees as earthly distractions for the believers. Things that the Colossian Christians might be allowing to distract them from following Jesus and the right path that he has led them on. I don't know about you, but I find it hard to correct people when we feel they are heading in the wrong direction. Especially spiritually. If somebody's taken a decision that is not going to be good for their spiritual, even physical or mental or emotional health, it can be really difficult to challenge people. And you may have had such an experience of having to, to sit down with somebody and speak to them or, or phone them and just express your concerns for them. How did that make you feel? Was it difficult? Was it tough? Was it awkward? Was it easy? Equally, some of us may have had a friend or family member speak to us and say, I'm really concerned about the way you're living or behaving or the choices, the life choices that you are making. How did that make you feel to hear that from a trusted friend or family member? And Paul doesn't just stop that with that list of don'ts of earthly things either. He goes on in verse 8 and says, But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. And in verse 9, do not lie to each other. It is not that Paul is somehow wanting to stop people from having a good time. It's not that being a Christian means we can't have fun anymore. But it does challenge us to how we should live pure lives that would please God and honour Christ. Now the first list of don'ts, there was quite a bit about sex in them. And sex is something we don't really talk about in the church or certainly in services of worship. I can't remember many occasions when I've preached on the theme of sex. Many people find it embarrassing. It's a private matter. But it's one of the ways that I think the devil can really get into our lives. As we can be, sometimes be distracted. Perhaps in marriage, attracted to other people. And how often do we see thoughts and desires about sex affecting marriages and families and breaking marriages and splitting families apart? All because in some way we take our eyes off God and focus on earthly things, earthly desires that may give a momentary a uh, moment of happiness, but that is very shallow and short-lived. But some of the other things that Paul speaks about, anger and malice, they are perhaps things that we might be able to uh, tap into a bit more easily, that we might realise that we can have issues that Paul speaks about about anger, rage, malice, slander and filthy language and lying. Maybe that is something we see more of 
in our lives. But when we turn to God and confess our wrongdoing, when we take our eyes off the earthly and look to the heavenly, when we say to God how sorry we are, God cleanses, renews, and restores us. I want to lead us in a prayer of confession. Now let us just close our eyes. Maybe in your mind, just picture something. It might be the candle flickering on the screen. It might be an image you have in your mind where you are feel close to God. A favourite place you might like to be. Think about that as I lead us in prayer. Forgiving God, we come before you in this moment. As this candle flickers, it represents light that dispels the darkness of sin and wrongdoing. May the light of Jesus shine in us and shine through us. May it highlight those areas of weakness and frailty that are in me and is in us all. Forgive us when our minds, thoughts and desires have taken our eyes off Jesus and onto our own desires. Cleanse us, renew us and restore us. And as part of our prayers, I want to invite you to remain with your eyes closed, to listen to a song. There are some powerful words in it. It is called, I'm no longer a slave to fear. The original version is quite a lively version, so I found a quieter version with three uh, young women singing this song. And I want to invite you just to sit, listen and reflect and allow these words of I'm no longer a slave to fear wash over you as we can be assured of God's true and full forgiveness when we seek his forgiveness for us.
we thank you that when we place our trust in you, loving God, we can be assured that we are your children and you care for us with a love that we can never fully fathom or grasp. We thank you and praise you. Amen. Recently we've painted the master bedroom in our manse. When I say we painted, I actually mean Ruth and our youngest daughter Evie painted our bedroom. And as part of that process we had to empty our wardrobes of all the clothes so that we can move them away from the wall so that Evie and Ruth could paint behind them. In so doing, I don't think Ruth had realised just how many clothes I had. And to be honest, when I saw the pile on the stair bed, I'd forgotten just how many clothes I had as well. She said to me, why on earth don't you wear some of these nicer, newer clothes that you have in your wardrobe, instead of some of these that are past their best? And I've got one of those t-shirts here that it's past its best. You probably can't see it fully, but it's splashed with paint. There's paint on the sleeves, there's one or two tears in it, and Ruth groans every time it appears in the ironing pile at home. And it's one that I use for DIY, and it's one that I use for riding on my bike. And I realise that my clothes have a sort of journey through their life. I first buy them, like this t-shirt is a new one that I've bought in the last couple of weeks online. And they, they go on a journey from being the best clothes that I wear for better occasions through normality and just wearing them as general clothes in the house. And then they venture down into the sort of DIY gardening, riding my bike uh, part of my life before they sadly uh, have to be discarded and put in the bin. And in some ways... That was a reminder to me as I was reflecting on this reading today. Because Paul encourages the Colossian readers to put off or to take off the old self. Paul says in the latter part of verse 9 of chapter 3, Since you have taken off your old self with its practices. And it's almost an image of taking off an old garment that the Colossian Christians had been wearing and that sometimes we wear. And it's about the sexual immorality, the malice, the anger, the bad language that we might use. It's when we become a Christian, it's about taking off that old self and putting on the new self. And Paul says in verse 10, put on the new self, which is being renewed in, the, in knowledge, in the image of its creator. Now, it's not about today, it's not about berating ourselves for any sin that we might commit, the wrongdoing that we might commit. But when we become followers of Jesus, we don't change overnight. It's not a, a quick change. It can be for some people. They can go from being uh, a heinous criminal to being forgiven, set free of whatever they used to do. But for many of us, it's a day by day. It's allowing through prayer, through reading God's word, through worshipping together, through fellowshipping and learning with other uh, sisters and brothers in Christ. God changes and transforms us. The theological word is sanctifies us. He's changing us day by day when we trust more in him as we give more of our lives to him. And Paul says to these Colossian readers, take off the old self and put on the new self. And we hear some of what that new self is as we clothe ourselves with what Paul says in verse 12 of our reading. Clothe ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Now I have to say patience is a real weakness mine I am not the most patient of people so every time I read this verse and other verses in the Bible that talk about patience it's an area that I really need to pray into in my life 
And Paul encourages his listeners to put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Love is almost the glue which holds all the other things together, the compassion, the kindness, the humility, the gentleness and the patience. The love of God is almost a glue that holds all that together. And it's when we have that love in our lives and we allow that love into our lives that it galvanizes and glues together all those other things that Paul encourages us to put on in our new selves. Put on love, Paul says, that binds them all together in perfect unity. And I pray that as we journey through Colossians, as we journey through life on our faith journey, that I said in the last couple of weeks, is isn't a one-off decision that we make. It's an ongoing decision to continue to give more and more of our lives to Christ. I hope that as I look back on my life that I'm a different person to I, what I was five years ago, three years ago, even one year ago. Because I should be changing as I give more of my life to Christ. And we should be changing as we give more of our lives to Jesus. So may we allow God to take off the old self and to put on the new that we may glorify God and be more like Jesus. Let us pray. Again, I want to invite you to close your eyes and hold out your hands in a posture of receiving. As I read to you some of the final words that we heard Carol read a few moments ago, but they're such powerful words and a real powerful prayer. And I want to read these words over us today. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. As you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. Amen. Our next song is a relatively, well, a newish one. It might be new to, to some of you. It's uh, a real powerful hymn and it's one I really love, a Christian worship song Father of Life Draw Me Closer Father of Life Draw Me Closer Lord my heart is set on you Let me run the race of time Within me. 
Today marks the start of Christian Aid Week. For some of us, we would usually be pushing envelopes through doors and the day after, or a couple of days after, be collecting them again. We uh, were able to give some money to the work of Christian Aid by doing this, but sadly this year, we're not able to do that because of the lockdown and the self-isolation. So I know churches have been looking at the Christian Aid website because there are different ways that we can give to the work of Christian Aid, which is so uh, sorely needed in many parts of our world. And I've put on the screen below, and I'll put it on again uh, at the end of the video today, the website for Christian Aid, and also a phone number that you can ring. If you're not on the internet, then maybe you could phone Christian Aid and give your donation that way this year. They're on the screen now, and they'll be on the screen again at the end of the service. But if you don't feel able to give, then what we can all do, and I encourage us all to do, is to pray for the work of Christian Aid, because they're really going to struggle to raise the sorts of funds this year that they have in previous years because of the lockdown. So please, if you can, give in a different and safe way this year for the work of Christian Aid. Let us pray. Loving God, who cares for all people across the globe, we come before you and lift to you the work of Christian aid. The money they usually raise will be severely hampered this year due to the fact that door-to-door -door collections cannot happen. We pray that you would move us, where possible, to give to the work of Christian aid. May monies given help those places which will struggle to fight against COVID-19. We pray for those who are sick in body, mind and spirit. We pray for the healing hand of God to rest upon them and give them the healing and wholeness you long to give them. We pray for those who struggle with addictions. We pray that you, Lord, would deliver them and protect them. We pray for those who struggle, who are abused, abused and trafficked in the world today. We pray for a release from the captivity of abuse and we pray for the love of Jesus to be shown to them by those charities that work to alleviate their suffering. We pray for your church, Lord, that we may be a shining light in the darkness, a beacon of hope where there is despair. We pray that churches will prepare for the time they can open the doors again and welcome people in. We pray for ourselves. We pray that you would comfort and strengthen us in our faith. Help us to continue to learn more of you as we journey through the letter to the Colossian Church. May the words challenge us and comfort us in our lives today and give us hope for the future. For we ask this prayer in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. And our final hymn, which I hope will be familiar to most of us, is another great hymn, I think. It's I, the Lord of Sea and Sky, that wonderful chorus in it that says, Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. Let us raise our roofs in praise as we sing this final hymn today.
before our final blessing, I want to invite you to watch a video. A video that's been put together, it's called The Blessing. It's been doing the rounds of Facebook and it's on YouTube. And it's uh, many worship leaders from across the country that have well, come together uh, virtually to record this service and uh, record this song, sorry. They've all been uh, in their own homes or places of worship and recorded this song. And I want to invite you. And it, it's been designed as a, a blessing over the United Kingdom. And I want us all to listen and to receive this blessing in these difficult and challenging times. Pray a blessing, manna rain down from heaven. This isn't second guessing, we know that we are protected. May the peace that surpasses all understanding be our message. Grace and favors in your nature, in your essence. May favor be upon you and a thousand generations. And your family, and your children, and their children, and their children. Please favor.
hope you enjoyed listening to that. And our final words of blessing. Loving God, by your empowering, may we be children of light, clothed in compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. May the Lord live in us and shine out through us by the power of the Holy Spirit. May we receive the blessing sung over us and may we in turn be this week a blessing to others because of Jesus. Amen. Have a good week and God's blessing be upon you and with you. God bless.